This is Work Lab, the podcast from Microsoft, where we'll hear from leaders and scientists about the surprising research and data that's transforming the way we work. I'm your host, Elise Hu. In 2030, work from home, I suspect we'll be in like Star Wars style holograms talking to each other. You heard that right holograms. Today, we're gazing into the future with Nicholas Bloom. He's a Stanford University economics professor who's studied remote and hybrid work for nearly 20 years, so way before it was a hot topic. Today, 81% of company leaders are changing their workplace policies to offer more flexibility, and that's according to a LinkedIn survey. Nick has actionable advice about how to manage that new flexibility and prepare for even more changes ahead. Later in the episode, we'll check in with Microsoft employee Emily Sturkin. She's navigated a lot of change in her own work and life lately, and she'll talk about what she's learned. But first, here's my conversation with Nicholas Bloom. Nick Bloom, Business Insider, has called you America's best work from home expert. So I want to know what surprised you about your own experience moving to working from home in the pandemic? My personal surprise, I really quite liked it. I have four kids, so it's nice to be around. It took a while to get used to it. I'm not very handy, but it took me about two hours to put up this desk that goes up and down. It's great. I'm actually standing up now. Generally, for me, it's worked really quite well. I'm getting to feel a little bit lonely. Stanford University just started going back in person now, so I've enjoyed that. I, I went to an event yesterday. It was really nice, actually, to see my colleagues. But I, like everyone else, it seems in the survey data, have found working from home generally works pretty well. I hope to be able to continue to do it maybe two, three days a week and go in person two, three days a week. Flashback to March 2020 for a minute. (laughs) I know that's not quite a time that any of us want to look back on, but really quickly, we went to work from home or work with home mode. And at that time, you predicted a productivity disaster for companies because we were having to deal with also homeschooling our kids and working in unsuitable places with no choice and no in-office days. It has now been 18 months What actually happened in terms of productivity? By now, and I'd say within six to nine months uh, after the beginning of the pandemic, productivity working from home turned out to be extremely good. I've been running surveys of 5,000 Americans uh, per month since the beginning of the pandemic. And one thing you hear from that and from talking to firms is everyone was universally amazed at how well working from home turned out. It possibly was a productivity disaster for the first month or two. Uh, everything was in such chaos, it was hard to tell what was going on. But certainly by you know late 2020, and certainly by now, 2021, it's clear working from home has worked out pretty well. How much did that surprise you? Well, I shouldn't have been surprised. I, I faced years of skepticism for being so positive on working from home pre-pandemic. In fact, I, you know, I did a... Uh, a large randomized control trial back in 2010 in China, and the folks that worked from home were 13% more productive. And that thing got a lot of coverage. I gave a TEDx talk, published a paper. So you know, I should have been the last person to be surprised. I'd love to hear more about the data that you've been able to collect, because it sounds like the top line findings are that hybrid work actually works, and it's here to stay. Yes, hybrid is here to stay. Five-day return to the office for people that are currently working from home is dead. I mean, that that died early to mid-2021. Any employer that is currently thinking of trying to get current work from home employees back to the office five days a week is dreaming. I mean, reason is you just face a mass wave of resignation. I've probably talked to, I don't know, three, 400 managers since the beginning of the pandemic and a lot recently. And there's not a single firm I talk to that's trying to get currently working from home employees back to the office. Well, just to be clear, about half of all Americans can't work from home. So these are folks that are in frontline retail, manufacturing, a lot of healthcare, public services. They have unfortunately never worked from home and are never likely to work from home given the roles they do. There's then the other half, professionals, managers, you know, basically university graduates, Pretty much all of us have been working from home close to full time throughout the pandemic. And it looks like now we're almost all of us work from home post pandemic, but probably two, three days a week. Based on this, what type of employees are you finding really want to work from home the most or more than other demographic groups? 
current working from home employees post pandemic want to work from home about two and a half days on average. Now, there's a big spread around that. And, you know, what you see is young single folks and older empty nesters basically don't like working from home that much. They want to come in four or five days a week. And then at the other end, people with young kids, uh, people living in houses with long commutes from the office, some you know minorities actually are uh, slightly more true for women have a higher preference to work from home. And some of them want to work from home, you know, full time post pandemic. What are the implications for having a diverse workforce? Diversity is a hugely important for working from home policy. I think there's a couple of things firms need to get right. One thing is to offer hybrid. Now, pretty much everyone's on that train already. The second thing that is important is to make sure that the days at home is also controlled and people do that. So here's the fear. Imagine you have a situation whereby, you know, all the single young men that live right next door to the office come in five days a week. And other people, you know, work from home two days a week and come in for only for three. You can see where that's going to lead in terms of promotion because there's plenty of evidence. If you come in extra days compared to folks you're, you know, fighting for that, you know, promotion for, you're likely to get ahead. I've been advising firms to A, suggest how many days you come in, but importantly, B, also suggest how many days you work from home. And a typical policy may be, say, I'd like everyone to come in on Monday and Wednesday. I'd like everyone to work from home on Tuesday and Friday in my team, and Thursday is your free day. You choose, which you do. But that way, we're all roughly doing the same thing. When we're in work, it's super social. We have all our lunches and leaving events and you know team bond building stuff. On the two home days, we know it's going to be quiet. There aren't going to be big meetings and work. And then on the, you know, the fifth day, it's a bit of a mix. That's interesting. Some leaders might want to give more flexibility than that, thinking there's no one size fits all. Plus, we know that underrepresented groups or some underrepresented groups prefer more remote work. Is that what you're seeing in the data? Yes. You know, if you look at it quite broadly, there are a few groups that show a stronger preference to work from home. One is disabled people. A second group turns out to be college-educated women with young kids, so kids under the age of 12. College-educated men with young kids also want to work more from home, but women within that cell even more so. If you look by race, we see that Black and Asian workers report higher preferences. Interestingly, if you also look by politics, people that report that they don't share the same politics as their colleagues want to work from home more. People that report that their colleagues don't respect their religion want to work from home more. Basically, what you're getting is actually people want to work in a diverse workplace. And if your workplace is not diverse, you know, people have more of a preference to work from home. And so, you know, there's kind of a reinforcing effect. If you want a diverse workplace, you want to make it, you know, successful to support working from home employees. That then helps to promote diversity and makes people want to come in. Lots of great advice there for times of change. Now let's hear from someone who's been managing a lot of change herself in work and life. Correspondent Mary Melton is talking to Microsoft employee Emily Sturkin today, who's had quite an eventful year and a half of hybrid. That's right. Emily is a communications expert who moved across the country twice in two years. She also left a job in the retail industry for a role at Microsoft. Thanks so much for joining us, Emily. Can you tell us why you've been on the move? I moved out to Seattle about nine years ago for a job opportunity and um, really loved the area, ended up staying a lot longer than I thought I would, started a family here, and my husband actually got a new job opportunity in Ohio. So we relocated to Ohio at the end of January 2020. So that was a few weeks before the pandemic. So we had a few weeks to kind of settle in. And then all of a sudden, we were all at home. So my husband and I were both working from home full time. Our two kids were home full time. Um, So it was a different experience than we thought it was going to be moving out there. It gave us a chance to think about where we really wanted to be. Ultimately, we just really loved the lifestyle that we had in Seattle. Our friends were here. Our house was here. And so he got the opportunity to uh, work from home from Seattle as opposed to uh, Ohio. So we moved back this summer. You also changed sectors and you discovered that your skills from the retail industry were also valued in tech. What have you learned that might help other people who are making these big moves right now? I think being open-minded is one of the most important mindsets you can have 
for any stage of your career, whether you're just starting or whether you're looking for a change, that you never know what an experience is going to end up feeling like and being like, and you never know what you're going to learn. And I think it's also about finding a company that is willing to take a chance on you. And Microsoft knew that I was not tech savvy or didn't have a tech background, but they were able to see some of those skills that I did have that they thought would translate really well. And so it's about finding the right match. Have you met any of your colleagues now that you have moved to Seattle? Have you seen anyone in person yet? No, I have not met a single person, but I feel like I'm forming relationships and getting to know people's personalities. I'm going to be on campus next week. So I think I'm going to have the opportunity to meet at least a few people in person, which will be really exciting. That was Microsoft communications expert, Emily Sturkin. Now back to Nick. Nick, the great reshuffle is one major labor trend of 2021, with so many people like Emily switching jobs and making big changes this year. Can we talk about uh, another couple of trends emerging now in this hybrid work world and how they'll play out in the future? One trend is the uh, the revival of the war for talent. People have probably forgotten that topic, but you know it is back with a vengeance. So the U.S. labor market is red hot, and one way companies I'm talking to are fighting bitterly for is by offering more and more generous work from home packages. What I mean by generous is the typical employee out there actually doesn't want to work from home five days a week. They actually on average want to work from home two to three days a week, but have some flexibility around it. So two companies I've been talking to have setups whereby they say, look, we're going to have three days a week in the office, two days a week at home. But each year, you're going to get one month or 22 days of additional days you get to choose when you work from home. And that is amazingly appealing because you can think, look, I'm going to have hybrid most of the time, but maybe one month a year I may, you know, go work from Mexico and I'm going to go, you know, hang out at the beach or go to, you know, Alaska or whatever I want. Yes. And the numbers really back that up. Eighty one percent of leaders are saying they are changing their workplace policies to offer greater flexibility like you're talking about. Yes. So another trend that is starting, I personally think is important to push ahead, improving flexibility for non-work from home employees. Half of Americans cannot work from home. They're frontline retail manufacturing, public services, teachers. A lot of the people we have to thank very much for our our ability to survive throughout the pandemic. These folks post-pandemic are not getting this amazing work from home perk. You know, this perk in our survey, hybrid work, appears to be worth about a 7 to 8% pay increase. For everyone that's getting hybrid, that's fantastic. For other employees, you know, you're really genuinely missing out. And so when I've been talking to firms, I've been saying, well, A, recognize that and maybe think about that in the way that you set pay for non-work from home employees to make it more generous. And B, think about ways to make it more flexible for them. For example, there's things like the 980 our scheme. So the idea here is every two weeks, rather than do two weeks of five days each, you do eight days of nine hours, one day of eight, and then you have the final Friday off. So you basically have every other Friday off. There is the four day week. So rather than work five days a week at eight hours each, you work four days at 10 hours each. Basically things that make it more flexible uh, in terms of working patterns that non-work from home employees can also benefit. This is interesting in that employees are becoming more empowered. And as employees are becoming more empowered, they are demanding more flexibility. Businesses are responding. So over the next five or 10 years or so, how do you expect the relationship between employee and employer to continue to change? As long as the economy continues to grow right now, you know, we're in a good rebound from the pandemic. I think employees will hold the upper hand. So in bargaining, you know, when I talk to employers, they're desperate to hire. And so, you know, all the power goes to the employees, to you know, to people like us in some way. I mean, it depends depends who's listening. If you're a manager trying to hire, maybe you're an employer. But as a result, perks like working from home, levels and flexibility are becoming much more commonplace because if you're a firm, you can go about having more, you know, hiring people through two ways. You can one, pay them, let's say 10, 20% more. You can basically outbid. Or you can say, look, I'm just going to be more generous on working from home. And the latter turns out to be cheaper and more profitable and makes sense because that's what employers want. One big move is greater flexibility that's driven by the strength of the labor market. The other thing that's kind of on the horizon in the long run is going to be improvement in working from home technology. 
I've been working and working from home for almost 20 years. And if you go back 20 years ago, when I first started, there were no video calls. There was no cloud. There was no file sharing. If you're working at home, you're basically phoning people up and you're emailing backs and forwards attachments with all the problems that has. Now, you know, we have shared files. We have teams. It's very, very easy to work remotely. That process of improvement of remote technology is actually only just beginning because the pandemic has led to an enormous surge of companies throwing money at getting work from home technologies up and running because the market's expanded. In one study, we went to the US patent office and we searched for new patents and how uh, often they mentioned work from home, remote work, et cetera. And you see this has really taken off after March 2020. So many tech firms, hardware firms are coming out with fantastic new technologies, virtual reality, cameras that track you, much better sound, much better video, connectivity tools that mean five to 10 years from now, we're going to look back at 2021 and think, that was terrible. How do we survive you know, with that, that poor quality equipment and uh, software? And in 2030, work from home is going to be, I suspect we'll be in like Star Wars style holograms talking to each other. Let's continue to talk about macro trends here because we are in this tectonic shift and the world as we know it has changed. We're charting a new economy, which leads to my question about onshoring and offshoring. How might companies change this up? I think the pandemic is going to lead to an explosion in outsourcing and offshoring. So I've spoken to quite a few managers that have said, you know, we've discovered throughout the pandemic that working from home works really well. I've had, you know, entire teams that haven't stepped foot in the office for the last 18 months and they've done really well. I've been thinking, why do they need to physically be in the office? And in fact, why does that team even need to be part of our company? Why do they need to even be in the country? A lot of managers are kind of joining the dots and saying, now is the time to think about offshoring, so maybe moving some of those teams out to, say, Mexico or China or India or South America, depends on your time zone and the other issues, or certainly outsourcing them. I think the pandemic is going to be for services trade as an outsourcing of service tasks in many ways what 2002 was to manufacturing. That's when China joined the World Trade Organization. There was a you know, huge increase in manufacturing trade with the U.S., I think we're going to look back on 2021 and see this is a hugely important point of inflection, whereby suddenly offshoring and outsourcing just explode. That's, you know, good for many people, but it also raises issues for firms to think about how to exploit this and make sure you're ready to adapt. I'm sure we'll hear more about offshoring talent in the next few years. Before we go, Nick, do you have any other research you'd like to share with us that's really struck you? A parting thought? Another quirky result I mentioned now is on handshakes, inspired, in fact, by Polita Clark. She's a journalist at the FT. She said the handshake is dead. So we thought, "Uh uh-huh, I wonder if that's true. And we surveyed two waves of 5,000 folks in the US. And lo and behold, what you saw is pre-pandemic for business greetings, two-thirds of people said they would shake hands. A third had an array of other things. Post-pandemic, Two thirds of women say they want to verbally greet people. Uh, the other third are mixed between handshakes and fist bumps, which tells you handshakes are pretty unpopular amongst women. For men, it's not quite as stark, but men are equally split a third, third, third between verbal greetings, handshakes, and fist bumps or something else. So the bottom line is if you're in a business environment, unless you're very certain the other person wants to shake your hand, I would not put your hand out, particularly if they're junior. There's a kind of power dynamic because you're going to end up forcing them to shake their hand and they may well be, you know, squirming inside and thinking, I really don't want to do this. You know, there's all kinds of weird and wonderful things you pick up from surveys, but I thought that was interesting. So many fascinating insights, everything from macroeconomic trends down to handshakes. Nick Bloom, professor at Stanford, thank you so much. Thanks so much for having me on. You've been listening to the WorkLab podcast from Microsoft. There's a WorkLab digital publication, too, where you can find a transcript of this very episode. Check out Microsoft.com slash WorkLab for more insights about the future of work. And please rate us, review, and follow us wherever you listen. The WorkLab podcast is a place for experts to share their insights and opinions. As students of the future of work, Microsoft values inputs from a diverse set of voices. That said, we do want to mention that the opinions and findings of our guests are their own, and they may not necessarily reflect Microsoft's own research or positions. WorkLab is produced by Microsoft with Godfrey Dadich Partners and Reasonable Volume. 
I'm your host, Elise Hugh. Our correspondents are Mary Melton and Desmond Dickerson. Sharon Killander and Matthew Duncan produced this podcast. Jessica Volker is the Work Lab editor. Thanks for listening.